Hello and welcome to the program Sula's Big Adventures with me Sula. This episode is about how to use a star chart or a star atlas with your telescope. If you're just starting out in amateur astronomy and you go outside at night and the sky just looks like an impossible jumble of stars, the first thing that you'll need to do is to get a planisphere and go out with your naked eye and your planisphere to learn the brightest stars and the constellations. In a separate episode, I'll go over how to use a planisphere if you're just brand new to amateur astronomy. In this video, I'm going to assume you already know the brightest stars and the constellations. And now you'll need a good star atlas or star chart. You can use a digital star chart on your phone or tablet, Sky Safari or Stellarium, but those can never replace a good written star chart, I think. And this video is about using written star charts and star atlases. I'm going to focus on how to use a star atlas such as Will Tyrion's Cambridge Star Atlas or Sky and Telescope's Pocket Sky Atlas or Sky Atlas 2000. Those are the most popular star charts. In all star charts, north is pointed up and east is on the left-hand side of the page and west is on the right-hand side of the page. In your telescope's eyepiece, north is always the direction of Polaris, the North Star, which is the closest star to the North Celestial Pole. If you push your telescope toward Polaris while looking through the eyepiece, new stars that come into the field of view are entering from the north. This was very confusing to me when I was just starting out. And if it's confusing to you, then the easiest thing to do is to look at the constellation you want to explore and compare it to how the orientation is on your star chart and then match that chart to how the orientation is in the sky. For example, let's say you want to look at something in Auriga. On the star chart, Auriga is pointed straight up like a pointy house. And when I look in the sky, it's on its side. So I turn my chart to match what I see in the sky. And if you look now, you'll see that the point, which is Delta Auriga, is pointing directly at Polaris. But now you'll need to know the orientation of your telescope and your finder scope, because most likely it does not match um, the star chart. And that's because telescopes with an equal number of mirrors, reflectors and Dobsonians, will show an inverted or upside down view and telescopes that use diagonals, refractors and Cassegrains, show a mirror image view. For reflectors, you just need to turn the star chart upside down. But for refractors and Cassegrains, what do you do? Well, you can keep a little mirror with you when you go outside and point your chart to the mirror to see what the map looks like in your telescope. Or you can take a mirror image picture of the star chart or use software to flip the image of whatever you want to look at before heading outside. Or you can just mentally flip the image in your mind's eye. <laughs> It's tough, but it can be done in a pinch if you didn't make a mirror map in advance. Or you can take out the diagonal and look straight through the telescope, but they may, ne may not be practical because the whole reason for having a diagonal is to make viewing through your telescope more comfortable. Another thing you can consider is purchasing an erect image diagonal, which will show the sky exactly as it appears to the naked eye. I personally do not use an erect image diagonal because they can severely degrade the image in your telescope. They are hard to make and they require precision polishing and most of them are cheaply made for that reason. And that's why they degrade the image. But there are some well-made ones you might 
consider using if you must have an erect image view. They're made by William Optics, for example, and Botter Planetarium. They're not cheap, though, because they're expensive to make well. But on the bright side, they can be used during the day for terrestrial viewing. Now you need to be aware that your finder scope on your telescope may have a different orientation than your telescope. If you have an erect image finder scope, it will show the sky exactly as it appears uh, to your naked eye and how it will look on your atlas. But if your finder has a diagonal, the image will be a mirror image. And if the finder scope is a straight through finder scope, the image will be inverted. For my Dobsonian, I purchased an erect image finder scope that matches what I see with my eye and matches the page, keeping in mind that north is toward Polaris and that east is 90 degrees counterclockwise. And this helps me find objects with my Dobsonian, even though the telescope itself has an upside down image. But if your finder scope is straight through and it sits on your Cassegrain telescope, just be aware that your finder scope will show the sky upside down and your telescope will show you a mirror image view. Once you know the orientation of your finder scope and your telescope, and unless they're both erect images, they'll be different from what you see on the page of your star chart. Next, you need to know what the field of view is for both the finder scope and the telescope. You can measure the field of view of your finder scope by pointing it at two stars that just fit inside the field of view of the finder scope. You could use the two pointer stars of the Big Dipper, Duby and Mirac, which just so happen to be almost exactly five degrees apart. If Duby and Mirac fit just inside your finder scope's field of view, then your finder scope shows a five degree field of view. And that's generally what most finder scopes will show. Your telescope's eyepiece will determine the field of view of your telescope. You can determine the field of view by taking the apparent field of view listed on the eyepiece and dividing that by the magnification provided by that particular eyepiece. For example, let's say you're using an eyepiece with a 50 degree field of view and the magnification provided using that eyepiece is 50 times, then the true field of view is one degree, 50 divided by 50. With extremely low magnification, you can sometimes have a field of view of more than one degree. And to find objects, you're always gonna be starting out with your lowest magnification. But let's just assume the field of view through the eyepiece is going to be around one degree and through the finder scope about five degrees because that's more or less going to be the case for both. Now with that information you can figure out how much of the sky you'll be able to see with your finder scope and your telescope and you can make a little guide for yourself out of wire to help you narrow down what you'll be seeing in your finder scope and telescope's field of view. You can use picture hanging wire or you can get copper wire like this. And what you want to do is to mold the wire into five degrees and one degree rings. An old film canister, if you can find one, or you're old like me and have them lying around, it turns out it's exactly five degrees. And you can also use the Telrad picture inside the cover of your Sky Atlas, or you can use the eraser end of a pencil. Or you can also cut out five degrees on a piece of paper using the angular distance on the chart and one degree also using your pencil. Now we have our indicators for the field of view for the finder scope and the telescope. But before we put them to use, we need to know what are all those dots and letters and colors on the chart? Well, the black dots are the stars and the bigger the dot, the brighter the star. The brightness of stars is indicated by their magnitude, with the brightest being negative one, and the dimmest, on this star chart anyway, 7.6, that's Sky and Telescope's dimmest star, indicated on the chart. 
and the constellations are shown by the green lines attaching the main stars of each constellation. The Milky Way is indicated by the darker blue. Double stars have a line through them. Variable stars have a white circle around them. Yellow dots are open star clusters. Yellow dots with a cross inside are globular clusters. And red dots and ellipses are galaxies. Green dots or shapes are bright nebulae. Dotted lines are dark nebulae. And green dots with four lines projecting out from them are planetary nebulae. But what about all these other things? M and VDB and IC. <laughs> Well, those things I'll cover in a later episode, but for now, just know that M stands for Messier object, and if there's no letter before the numbers, they're referring to an NGC catalog object, and the Greek letters next to, to the stars are their Bayer designation, with the brightest star in each constellation being designated Alpha, and next brightest Beta, and so on, through to Omega. We'll go into more detail on naming conventions and designations in an upcoming episode. Now let's use our five degree ring and our one degree ring or our piece of paper to locate an object. Let's go back to Auriga and say we want to look at M37 or Messier 37, an open cluster. The star Theta Auriga looks to be about magnitude two and if I put that star right at the edge of my five degree ring or circle, I can see that M37 will be just at the opposite edge of the field of view of my finder scope. And since Theta Auriga is magnitude 2, I'll be able to easily find it, even with the red dot finder. I'm going to orient my map with the top of the page pointing to Polaris, and then I know that M37 will be due south from Theta Auriga. Now that I know that Theta Auriga and M37 will both fit in a five degree field of view of my finder scope, all I do is I put Theta Auriga at the far northern edge of the finder scope field of view, and then I should see M37 at the far southern edge of the field of view. Then I center M37 in the center of the crosshairs of my finder scope's field of view, and that should put it within the one degree field of view of the telescope, which is next to a magnitude six, it looks like star. And if I've centered it in the crosshairs and I've already lined up my finder scope with my telescope, it should be in the telescope now in the eyepiece. But before you start, take your telescope out during the day and make sure your finder scope is lined up with your telescope. Point it to a distant object. I like to point mine at that cabin. It's, I guess it's about a mile or more away. So I point it at that cabin and I get it in the finder and then I get it in the telescope. And once they're both looking at that cabin, the peak of the roof of that cabin, then I'm lined up and I'm ready to take the telescope out at night. And as long as your finder scope and your telescope are precisely lined up, if you can't find any wire, the paper method works the same way. This is five degrees for your finder scope. Move it to the center. And then your telescope is only gonna show this much field of view. So just like I explained with the wires, that's how you would do it with a piece of paper. Now that we've found and enjoyed looking at M37, beautiful star cluster in Auriga, we can go for the dark nebula B34, which fits easily within the five degree field of view of the finder scope, but you won't be able to see it with your finder scope. You'll just have to judge by moving from B37 about two degrees west and just a little bit south and putting that in the center of the finder scope and then it should be within the one degree field of view of the telescope. This requires a precise alignment before you start of your finder scope and your telescope. And please note that 
Barnard 34 or B34, Dark Nebula and Auriga has an opacity of four. So very difficult and it requires a 200 millimeter aperture or bigger, but you can try for it. <laughs> Note that you may not be able to find that when dark nebulae are hard. See my video on dark nebulae. <laughs> Before looking for either of these objects or for any object, you need to plan ahead of time by making a list of objects you'd like to look for and look them up, look for their location, their size, and their magnitude, and print out your mirror image map if you need one or two. And you can find out more about planning for your session in my video about planning and observing session. You need to know the magnitude and the size of each object you want to observe in order to find out if it's even feasible for you to see the object with whatever size telescope you'll be using and more importantly in the area where you'll be observing in other words how dark is the sky how transparent is the sky where you intend to observe m37 was pretty easy to find because it's close to a fairly bright star but these steps will at least get you started and with practice, keeping in mind that north is always in the direction of Polaris and that east is 90 degrees counterclockwise from north and knowing the scale and the field of view of your finder scope and your telescope with various eyepieces, you'll soon be able to use these techniques to match your star chart to the sky and use the star chart or star atlas to find objects in the sky with your telescope. So that's it for now. I'll see y'all soon. Until then, get outside and enjoy the night sky. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off.